To keep Canadians safe, to mitigate the economic impacts of the virus, all levels of government are working together. It has been a turbulent time for Canada's public service, an unprecedented response to COVID-19, the first ever use of the Emergencies Act. Freedom! The federal government has invoked the Emergencies Act. At the centre of all of that decision-making, the Clerk of the Privy Council, Janice Charette has worked in Canada's public service for nearly four decades. And as the clerk, her job was to be a nonpartisan advisor to the Prime Minister as Deputy Minister and Secretary to the Cabinet. That included advising on some big decisions like how to manage the public health restrictions through the pandemic and economic supports for Canadians. How to restore order during the self-styled Freedom Convoy. Friday was her last day as clerk. I sat down with her earlier this week. Janice Charette, nice to see you. Thank nice you for doing you. this. Thank you, Rosemary. Thank you for having me. I want to talk a little bit about your role during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. At a time when you were dealing with, I think it's fair to say, an unprecedented government response, you've had some time to reflect on that period, I'm sure now, and, and sort of what was, I don't know if you can say the most challenging part of that, but what was, it was obviously you were doing something you had never even imagined possible. Right. So, so talk to me a little bit about what that was like. Well, um, I think when I came back, I had been in London for the early part of the pandemic as the High Commissioner. I came back here to be the clerk. And uh, at that point in time, we were like yet another wave was upon us. And so, you know, what was the right balance in terms of restrictions on people's liberties, mm -hmm. but and, and therefore on economic activity and how to support people through all of that at the same time as we're like trying to get the public health response ready, whether that was testing or masking or vaccinations. And so it was really to try and find the right balance between you know, making sure that we were helping people to get through it at the same time as those unbelievable and frankly unprecedented restrictions on people's activities. And how long could that go on for? Um, and uh, my job was to try to make sure that the public service was supporting this, this incredible pace of decision making mm -hmm. and rolling out mm -hmm. of, uh, of programs and benefits and services to help support Canadians. So um, it, was, it was a challenging time. And the challenge, I think, was how long we could maintain that. Yeah. And I think we showed that um, you know, there were limits to how long that, uh, that that could hold out. And I'll get to that, because there's yeah. certainly one thing you had to deal with that, that demonstrates that. But talk to me about the pace of the decision making during that time, because that's something that everyone has sort of thought about, how quickly huge decisions were made, mm -hmm. how much money was pushed out the door mm -hmm. in order to respond. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, I wonder whether that didn't also contribute to what you're talking about there. The, 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 the other part of that is whether people then saw how powerful the public service and a government could be in their lives, and then when it wasn't there, sort of what happened next. But, but talk to me about whether you think that speed and that pace is something to continue with or aspire to, or whether you've learned anything from that. I think one of the things that I completely believe about the public service is that in a crisis, we can be magnificent. We can really rally to do whatever is necessary to make sure that we are there for Canadians, mm -hmm. particularly when they need us the most, and that's what the pandemic showed. So we were able to support more agile decision making. We were, we were able to rally resources from across the system really quickly to be able to deal with this unprecedented situation. Yes, there was an awful lot of money spent, but you know, Canada has come through this pandemic crisis in terms of any long-term effects on the economy or on our labor force in remarkable ways. And I wonder whether um, we, we've seen in the past, I don't know, 12 months or so, some frustration with service delivery. Passports obviously would be a good example. And I wonder whether um, some of that frustration is built from the fact that people saw things get done very quickly. We come sort of almost out of the pandemic and then people are frustrated they can't even get a passport. And I wonder where you think the public service has to do better in terms right. of, you're not in a crisis, so you don't have to respond, but you do have to do better with service delivery. I think that's 100% true, uh, Rosemary. The, you know, one of the things that I think we, we ran a little bit of a risk of during the pandemic is no matter what the problem was, government was in a position to provide the answers because they had to, right. they had no choice. And then we had this re like quite rapid exit from a lockdown situation. And I think in the public service, maybe we underestimated how quickly people were gonna to wanna to return to their yeah. lives, how quickly they were gonna to wanna to travel and have their passport. But you know, in all humility, we know we have to do a better job there. 
I, I want to talk about the Emergencies Act a little bit. Um, you became very public during that because you had to testify at one point. Um, you said uh, during your testimony that your staff, you told them not to leave any stone unturned with right. trying to find a resolution to the convoy that was right outside your office as well. C can you give me a sense of how you got there to, to the Emergencies Act? So um, remember by the time we were getting to the point where I made that now infamous statement about leave, leave no stone yeah. unturned, uh, we had been a couple of weeks already uh, with protests not just in Ottawa but across the country right. and we were hearing, hearing disturbing reports about some of the nature, not just of the, there was a lot of people who came and who were protesting in a very peaceful way, who had a point to be made and totally legitimately. But there was, there was another element that we were concerned about uh, in terms of the protest. You know, we were monitoring this. Uh, you know, our instinct would be first line of defense should be uh, a local response and then work with the provinces and territories. And we were kind of the government of last resort. Right. Um, and so as we were watching this, we were, we were really trying to think about, okay, so what could the federal government bring? That was one of the prime minister's comments and questions to me all the time. Is there anything else we can be doing yeah. to help? Are there any other resources we can be bringing to help? And so my, my comment to my deputy minister colleagues is, are we making sure that there's nothing else in the toolkit, powers, resources, capabilities that we have that we could deploy to help this situation. Mm -hmm. Only when we got kind of to the end of that road did we say we have to look at whether or not there are other legal instruments that might give us extraordinary powers in an extraordinary situation. When you're um, giving that advice and, and contemplating things and, and offering your opinion, do you, in those moments, under, like, do you, do you feel the weight of it and the gravity of it? What was that like for you? Well, I remember very much thinking, um, you know, we have never used this piece of legislation. So we, implicit in that is you are going to make history. But you also don't want to be intimidated by that either. Mm -hmm. You want to make sure that you're thinking this through and not overweighting, oh my goodness, you know, is there some, the public service is known for being risk averse. You yeah. don't want to bring a, bring a bias, oh my gosh, it's such a big thing, oh, maybe we shouldn't do it. Is it the right instrument at the right time with all the right protections around it? We looked a lot at the accountability provisions and see whether we had the balance right there. So it was very much on our minds, mm -hmm. it was a big deal. Um, and, uh, you know, want to make sure that the Prime Minister and Ministers had a, a really good chance to debate and discuss this uh, before they were actually going to move forward. What was it like, um, what did that tell you about the state of the country, that, that moment, in terms of the, the di you know, the societal discourse around that, um, how troubling that is from, from your vantage point, that there were people that felt that they had to do that or they were that angry with the government or whatever was motivating them? There was, there was a legitimate debate to be had about whether or not <clears throat> public health measures, in a large measure that were not federal measures, no, exactly, right? Yeah. A lot of them were provincial measures yeah. that were put in place to protect people, had been in place either too long or they'd gone too far. Uh, that people felt that they were being restricted in terms of going about their lives. So did we have that balance right? There was a legitimate, a very legitimate debate and discussion to be had around that. And, you know, part of a democracy is lawful protest. Yeah. So that, that was not the concern for me. The concern for me was this other element that we saw creeping into it. And it almost felt like there was, a, an, uh, there was uh, some taking advantage of what was a widespread protest, a widespread debate going on by people who had a different point to make. Foreign interference has been a big topic. As it still is. still is, so I know you'll be limited there in, in terms of what you can or are willing to say. The, the, the role of the clerk, you're one of the people that sits on the, the site committee, the election oversight committee, which uh, is supposed to sort of monitor how things are going during an election. I wonder if you think that committee, which is right now supposed to, um, I guess, determine when a certain threshold has been met to alert the public of miss, um, of someone getting involved and in influencing an election. I wonder whether you think that issue of threshold needs to change and whether public servants are still best suited to play that role. So let's talk about what the threshold is yeah. first. It's not about whether somebody's trying to influence or interfere in the election. It's yeah. whether actually there is Canadians have a, that the democratic process is going to lead to a free and fair election okay. for Canadians. So 
foreign interference has been going has been going on in Canada yeah. is going on in Canada um, is ubiquitous and it's growing right. that's the challenge so was it happening yes it was happening was it interfering with the with the ability for mm -hmm. Canadians to make deliberate choices on their own behalf about the government that they wanted to put in place that's the threshold right. that the panel has being asked uh, to look at I think that con Canadians can have confidence that the people who are sitting in that election panel mm -hmm. do have the best interests of Canadians and are trying to protect their democratic rights. Even though there are people who try to politicize the public service and those roles? The, you know, the, uh, I think part of, uh, part of the public service in 2023 is that we are no longer anonymous, faceless bureaucrats, as yeah. once was the contract yeah. once upon a time. I think the, the world that we live in now, there's a lot more visibility, a lot more, um, we're a lot more public figures, the Public Order Commission. Yeah. People now know who I am um, and know a bit about what the clerk of the Privy Council does. So um, I think that the challenge is we don't defend ourselves. We, um, we are there to make sure that governments have information and can make informed decisions and we implement their decisions. We're, we don't exist to defend ourselves as an yeah. institution. Yeah. What will you miss? The people. I'll miss the people. I mean, I've worked on lots of files and lots of issues and lots of crises and <laughs> lots of departments, uh, but the chance to work with my deputy minister colleagues who are brilliant and committed and very hardworking, but public servants at all levels, um, and the ministers that they serve. It's truly, public service is a team sport, I say, um, and uh, it is, it's all about the people who I've had a chance to work with along the way, who, who are really just trying every single day to bring their best, to make, uh, to make Canada, as I said, the greatest country in the world. Public servants do every single day touches tangibly the lives of Canadians and people who want to come here. Hmm. Who, could, who could not love that? Who could not love that? Thank you for your time. Thank you for your service. Thank you, Rosemary. Thank you, Thank you for having, having me here today. Thank you.